There we go. So today is the myth, sort of, of Rip Van Winkle. This is a very modern myth. I wanted to do something from the USA. And of course, the USA is a pretty young country, to be honest. So um, if we're looking for uh, deep old myths, we can go, of course, to Native Americans and we can look at their myths. But I, I wanted something that fits with the USA itself. Um, so today, Rip Van Winkle, this is a story that was written um, uh, early in the 1800s and has become a very, very famous story, both in America and across the world. Um, but before we get to the story itself, we do need to know a little bit of the history or, well, we won't understand much of the story. Hmm. Um, now, if you're afraid of that, if you're like, no, history, terrible, good morning, finger snail. Um, the history behind this story is actually kind of like a story itself. So there you go. It's Think of it as an extended story. Well, Nico loves history, so it's okay. So does the Boston Public Library. Hang on, what? What are you doing in the chat, Boston Public Library? Hmm, hmm, strange. Okay, so our story today starts not with Rip Van Winkle. We will come to him. This isn't Rip Van Winkle on the screen. This is a guy called Henry Hudson. Henry Hudson. Um, uh, Freya, do stop pressing that button, please, because I cannot see my screen. Thank you. Um, uh, so, yes, Henry Hudson was an explorer, an adventurer, a real person. This is someone from, you know, real history. Um, and he was an Englishman, but he wasn't doing his exploring for the English. He instead joined a company um, called the uh, Dutch East India Company. Hmm. Now, as you may guess from the name, the Dutch East India Company comes from Holland, the Netherlands. Yeah, they are Dutch people. Uh, but Henry Hudson himself is English. And part of his exploring job, um, well, his main aim of his exploring job was to find a way, a way to Asia where he could buy spices and wonderful things to make a load of money. Um, now, Natasha Archer says there must have been a lot of rough weather. Um, I think that's funny because he's wearing a rough <laughs> and there was a lot of rough weather. In fact, uh, Henry Hudson was trying to find a path from Europe, from the Netherlands, Holland, um, over to places like India uh, or China or Japan. Uh, but they didn't want to go the traditional way, sort of down round the Horn of Africa and back up into the Indian Ocean. Instead, they wanted him to find a path through the Arctic. Now, this led Henry Hudson to try and get up past Canada. And he finds a lot of stuff in Canada, including the humongous Hudson Bay, um, which ironically, well, maybe not surprisingly, is named after him. Yeah. Um, now, he doesn't manage to get over to Asia by going north. There's too much ice. And as we'll see in a second, his ships um, are made out of wood and they're not particularly well, uh, well suited to traveling through Arctic ice flows. Uh, think the Titanic, that was a metal ship that hit an iceberg, that sank. What would a wooden ship do? Sink quicker, oh dear. So Henry Hudson decided, uh, quite against orders, he was told to go north up through the ice flows. He didn't. Um, he, instead of going home though, he decided he'd go and try to get through North America. You know, maybe if he followed the rivers, from the ocean, he'd just get through to the other side. Um, long story short, he failed at that, but he did find something quite impressive on his ship, the Half Main. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. It, I mean, today we'd call it the Half Moon, but back then the spelling was the Half Men. Mm, yeah, that's officially how they said it, probably. Mm, I don't know. Um, <laughs> there are lots of things called Hudson. It was really, really weird. I mean, fa fancy, you know, imagine it. You're traveling up a river. You ask the locals, what's the name of this river? They say, it's the Hudson River. You go, whoa, that's my name. What a coincidence. That isn't what happened. Um, he actually called it the Mauritius River, I believe. But then after he died, they named it after him because he was so good at finding wet things. 
yeah, well done, Hudson. Have another thing named after you. We will call it the Hudson River. And that's what it's called today. Now, the half moon sailed him up the Hudson. But if you know your geography, there isn't a river that leads all the way through from the east coast of America to the west coast and out to Asia. So he failed in that mission. But he did find some really cool geography. Things like the Catskill Mountains behind me. There's the Hudson River running through with the mountains in the background. Ooh, pretty. Um, oh, hang on. Um, <laughs> Freya is telling me that actually wooden ships would sink slower because wood floats. I, d I'm, I don't know. I've never tried sinking more different varieties of ship, but you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> Rowan asks, is there one more dancing girl? There is not, Rowan, I'm afraid. I mean, there may be, but not in these mountains, not at this time. Hmm. So, the, the, the ship, it goes up the river, it explores, it finds loads of cool stuff, um, and it leads to, this discovery, leads to the founding of a city. But um, unfortunately for Hudson, he doesn't really get to enjoy it, because... Hudson's going to disappear. It's 1609 when he finds the Hudson River and explores that area. Then he goes back to, to Holland, and then he sets out on a new ship, the Discovery, which is spelt you know, just like we would spell Discovery. It's not quite as interesting as the half man. Yeah, man. Um, instead, uh, the Discovery is going north. This time, they're not going to try the rivers. They're going to try and get past those ice flows again. And he does a lot of cool exploring, finds a lot of cold things in Canada, you know, Canada full of cold things. He finds loads of them, probably names most of them after himself. Um, but unfortunately, after a while, um, Mr. Hudson, um, who has taken his son with him on the journey, by the way, I, I believe that's the boy in this picture um, uh, that uh, Eliza was asking about there. Um, he's up there trying to get through the ice, but the rest of his crew decide... We don't like it here. It's too cold. We don't want to keep traveling around in very cold, icy conditions. We would like to go home now, please, Captain Hudson. And Hudson says, No, I will find a route through to Asia, even if it kills me. Hmm. Now, there are a few people on the ship who agree with Captain Hudson, one of them being his son. But the rest of the crew, they're not so keen. And they decide to mutiny. Ooh which means there's going to be a rebellion on the ship. And there a rebellion there is. The crew, they turn against the captain and they bundle him into a small boat with his son and I think seven or eight other men who um, were on his side. And they push the boat away from their big ship. And uh, then they sail away. Oh no. Now for a time, Hudson and his men, they row as fast as they can to keep up with the big ship with the Discovery, but the Discovery opens up its wide sails and disappears off into the distance. And that's the last time that Hudson, or his son, or his crew were ever seen. Dum dum dum! Now the question is, did they die there in their little boat in the freezing cold? Or did they, I don't know, go and live with the polar bears and have fun for the rest of their lives? We don't know! They disappeared. No one has ever found any uh, trace of Hudson's little ship, or Hudson's crew, and so it's just a big mystery. Uh, Rowan just says they drowned. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's a mystery. Ooh. Now, um, of course, before he died, on his, ver on his journey up the Hudson River, that had led to a fine discovery. I said that he discovered the Catskills, and he discovered the Hudson River. That's brilliant. I mean, well done you. But he also found something else. Something brown and furry with a great big tail and little gnawing teeth. He found a huge amount of beavers. <gasps> and when he uh, sent his messages back to Holland, back to the Netherlands, he told them all about the amazing beavers. There are loads of them. Beavers everywhere. Beavers on beavers. Beavers riding beavers, uh, beavers inside beavers, like Russian dolls. I don't know. He made it sound like there were definitely loads of beavers, though. Um, and the Dutch, they liked this a lot. Because in the 17th century, and to be honest, the 18th century, and the 19th century, beavers 
equal big money. Big money. Because, well, just think of all the things you can do with a beaver. Well, you can make hats out of beavers. That's one thing that you can make out of beavers. I can't think of anything else. But my goodness, the Europeans, they loved, absolutely loved hats made out of beaver because you could get beaver fur and you could make it so it's beautifully waterproof, yeah? Now this beaver does not like the idea. No, no, but it's okay. I'm not gonna make a hat out of this beaver because I've trained this beaver just to sit on my head as it is. So it's okay. But the beavers of North America, they were not so lucky. They were hunted by the Dutch and by others from Europe uh, to make beautiful hats that were waterproof and warm and fashionable at the same time. Mm, pretty cool. Now, the Dutch, they decided then to start a new country in North America. <laughs> Squirrel fight. No, don't hate the Dutch. This isn't like an anti-Dutch thing, <laughs> I'm just saying. Lots of people were, 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 were killing the beavers for fur, and those, those fur hats were being sold in Paris and London and Milan and all over Europe, yeah? So it's not, it's not necessarily the Dutch's fault. Uh, um, oh, Kit says they were hunted for scent glands. Now that's true, I did read that actually, that yes, you can uh, use their musk from their scent glands to, to do cool things with, yes. And I believe you can eat them too. I assume once they skinned them, they, they ate what was left, I guess. Wow, look, MB Shadow Girl is half Dutch. That's very cool. Uh, that's good, because this story uh, is the other half of you English, MB Shadow Girl. Because if so, you'll, you've got like two sides of this story today. That's good. Mm -hmm. So in 1624, this is a little while now after Hudson has disappeared, the Dutch, they make a new country in North America, and they call it New Netherlands because it's like the Netherlands, but newer. And they make a little city, at first a little town, but it grows into quite a big city, called New Amsterdam. And they make that, um, they name that after the original Amsterdam, which is, um, yeah, that's, uh, well, maybe they're not that original at naming things, basically. Uh, they like new things. So we have a little town called New Amsterdam, in a country called the New Netherlands. Now, if you've never heard of New Amsterdam before or the New Netherlands, it's because, well, they didn't stay that way for long. Um, in 1664, the English decided they would like that town, please. Hmm, but we don't like the name. No, we need something more original, more flashy. They thought about Apple-themed things and they decided to call it New York. There you go. So New Amsterdam becomes New York. And here's a little picture of New York with the Statue of Liberty standing outside, you know, bringing liberty to people. Yes. Um, and it, quite a few people in the chat already knew that it was going to become New York. So well done, guys. Um, now, uh, the time that we're looking at, though, is going to be a little bit after this. New York becomes an important city. <laughs> Eliza says, does she hold an ice cream? No, she's holding a torch. I mean, maybe an ice cream would have been better. I don't know. Um, <laughs> oh, Boston Public Library, you would know this, I guess. Uh, it's telling me that the Statue of Liberty was built by Mr. Eiffel. Of course, it was uh, built by the French and given to the, uh, the Americans as a gift because both countries had done a very similar thing. They'd got rid of the kings. <laughs> get rid of the kings, put up a statue, hurrah! Now, um, this story, we haven't even started the myth yet, really, but this story is based about around what happens when things change hands. It's about independence, freedom, liberty. It's about, um, yeah, changing things for the better. But unfortunately for our main character today, it's going to be quite a, a tricky transition from one thing to the other. <laughs> Embu Shadow Girl is telling me that her brother is half Dutch too. That would make sense. Yes, that's cool. Um, so you and your brother, if you stand next to each other, I suppose you make one Dutch person. Is that how that works? Hmm. Basic maths. Um, oh dear. Um, Jules is telling me that they will destroy all people who wear beavers. No! <laughs> so, um, our story 
takes place a little while after this, 1664, we've got New York City, we've got the English in charge, and the English, they spread out around the area. No longer is it called New Amsterdam. Instead, they call it the 13 colonies, the 13 colonies of England in North America. Now, if you know your geography, there are no 13 colonies in North America anymore. Instead, there's something else. And this story is all about that, or at least partly about that, I guess. Hmm. So just to give you an idea of where we are in the world, we're in the Catskill Mountains. They're not, I mean, you'll notice they're not quite the Himalayas, these mountains. Some people call them hills, but that's a bit disrespectful. I mean, I'm sure the beavers that live there, they call it the mountains. Um, but here's our map. And our red dot here is where the Catskill Mountains are. You'll see they're not far from New York City. Um, and it's, it's in the North of America. This rough area here was the 13 colonies where the English lived. Uh, the rest of the USA that is today was not the USA back there. It was just, just wilderness, a lot of it, um, especially the further west you get. Um, let me see. Uh, ooh. That's bizarre. I am asking myself, are there cats? I'm sure there are cats in the cat skills. I'm sure they're very talented cats because they got cat skills. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious when you think of it. No, it's not. Um, so there is where we are. We're in the Catskill Mountains, just north of New York, not far from the border with Canada on our map. That's the line here. That's Jaggedy Line. That's the border with Canada there. So it's a place that's nice and warm in the summer, but pretty cold in the winter up there in the Catskills. Um, but our story starts, and now we can finally introduce our main character, because our story starts in a little village. Not much of a place. You know, a small, quiet place. There's a load of houses, there's a little church, there's um, a school, a little one, you know, not big. Um, there's a pub, an inn, uh, but not much else really. And this little village, we don't have a name for it, unfortunately, but it's somewhere there at the bottom, at the foothills of the Catskills, maybe near the Hudson River, I don't know. Um, but there is a little village and it's filled with people with Dutch names. These are people who moved there to America um, in those early days when it was still called New Amsterdam instead of New York. Um, and they've lived there for a long time. They all, they're all American now. They all speak English because that's the main language in America, or at least in this story they are. Um, and one of those people, the most beloved person in the whole village, a person who was so impressive that everyone loved him. All the people loved him. All of the children loved him. They would follow him around and jump on his back and you know play with him. And all the dogs loved him. It said that not a single dog would ever bark at this person. They would, but some of the dogs would bark at other people, but no, they would never ever bark at him. He was gentle and clever and kind. But like all things in life, he was not perfect. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, Blue Star asked me why are they called the Catskills. I have no idea why they're called the Catskills, I'm afraid. Um, I didn't look that up. Uh, hmm. I don't, I'll see if I can find out for you. I, I'm a bit interesting now as well. Oh, Sophie questions maybe it's his temper. He doesn't have a temper. He himself is a very calm guy, and his name is Rip Van Winkle. Here he is with his gun. Now, Rip Van Winkle, he has a couple of children, he has a girl and a boy. Um, his son is also called Rip Van Winkle. We'll call him Rip Van Winkle the second, I suppose. Um, you know, both young, young kids, his, his son and his daughter. And he has a dog called Wolf. Um, here's Wolf here, his little, uh, little white doggo. Um, now, Wolf is his faithful companion. And Wolf will be everywhere that Rip Van Winkle goes, so will Wolf. Uh, Wolf loves him, he loves Wolf, everything is great there. Um, but there is a minor flaw to Rip Van Winkle's character because yes, he's lovely. And yes, everyone loves him. And yes, he's kind and gentle and funny and all that stuff. But as we can see, and what I've done today is I've taken some quotes because we're working from a book here, or at least a short story um, written by Washington Irving um, uh, early in the 19th century. 
Um, I've taken some quotes out, some that I find particularly uh, good, because if you do get a chance to read the original, this story is written in a far more eloquent way than I could ever tell it. Um, but here's a nice way of putting it. The great error in Rip's composition was an insuperable, insuperable aversion to all kinds of profitable labor. In other words, he doesn't like working. He will not work for money. Now, this is a problem. Um, it does say, Washington Irving tells us that he's quite happy to sit all day fishing. You know, he'll sit there by the edge of the water with his fishing line and he won't get bored. So it's not through want of, you know, he's not trying to avoid hard work necessarily, but he does not like the idea of working for money. And so he doesn't do it. He's calm. He's happy. He's pleasant. Um, but he's also not very profitable. And this leads to problems with his wife. Um, we never learn the name of his wife. We call her Dame Van Winkle. Um, but we know that he is married to her. And to be honest, she is a massive problem to him. No matter what he does, and to be honest, he doesn't do much, so it's not hard. But whatever he does, she's always moaning and telling him off and whining at him. Oh, Eliza says, let's call her Miranda. Okay, yeah, Miranda Von Winkle. <laughs> Miranda Van Winkle. I don't know how Dutch that is, but it sounds good to me. Okay. Um, now, <laughs> um, oh, Sophie asks, is Wolf there when he fishes? I assume so. Yes, he's a good dog. I'm sure he might even help with the fishing. I don't know. Oh, look, here we are. Isabel is telling us about the cat skills. It was only after Irving's stories that cat skills won over Blue Mountains and several other competitors for naming, I guess. Well, the meaning of the name, Cat Creek in Dutch, and the, and the uh, namer are settled matters. There you go. So thank you, Isabel. It's been named after the Dutch words for Cat Creek. There you go. Hmm. The Cat Creek Mountains. I like it. I'm sure there must be cats there. It sounds like it. <laughs> Rowan is telling me that fishing is a job, not the way that Rip Van Winkle did it. Um, he would happily fish and he would happily catch fish, but he would never sell them. Yeah, and he's not going to go and do some, he's not going to go work on a farm or anything to make money, um, which means his family is quite poor and his wife is angry all the time. She's just shouting at him and calling him names and telling him he's useless. Now, everyone else in the village, they're constantly hearing her shout and scream at him and tell him off. And they always take Rip Van Winkle's side because, well, as I said, everyone loves him. He's amazing. He's a really cool guy. Everyone wants to be his friend. But that's different, I suppose, than having to live with the man who doesn't really do much, just sort of wanders around. Um, and this is how um, our author puts it. Times grew worse. As years of matrimony rolled on, a sharp tongue is the only edged tool that grows keener with constant use. Oh dear. In other words, the longer they stayed married, the more vicious she got, the more cross she got, and the sharper her tongue got. Until poor Rip Van Winkle, he would do anything he could every single day to keep away from her. And the thing he did most, we've already established he doesn't really like doing work, the things that he... Um, like spends most of his time doing, is going and sitting on a bench. A bench that just so happens to be outside of the local pub. Um, and he will sit there with his friends day after day, um, discussing and talking and uh, chatting about this and that. Now, a lot of the time, him and his friends will sit around talking about not much at all. Um, the weather why the Catskill Mountains called the Catskill Mountains, if anyone's found a good beaver recently, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> um, oh, uh, Nico says, just divorce the wife. Um, I, that's not really the way things were done back then. You kind of had to put up with it. It's all right, there's a happy ending though, um, for at least one of these people, yeah. Um, <laughs> Squirrel Flight says, you are useless, Rip, Rip Van Winkle. Um, quite right, quite right too. He is a bit useless. Um, but he sits outside on this bench, outside the local pub, drinking beer all day and mostly talking nonsense. Every now and again, though, someone will bring a newspaper, 
yeah, that they found. I mean, this is a little out of the way place. This is far away from New York. I mean, I know on the map that we saw it's relatively close, but still, it's a, a couple of days journey to get to the city. So they're starved of news a lot of the time. Um, out there in the pub, um, they every now and again come across a newspaper and they will talk about it. And his three main friends are Derek Van Bummel. Now, Derek Van Bummel is um, the local schoolmaster. He teaches the children in the school. I don't know why he's always sat on the bench outside the pub, but there you go. Um, then we've got Nicholas Vedder. He's the man who owns the pub and will often spend a lot of his days sat out there with the other three, uh, chatting and talking whilst you know his daughter serves the drinks. And then you've got Van Shaik, who is supposed to be the local priest, and he will sit there too. So these four men, Rip and Derek and Nicholas and Van Shaik, they will sit there chatting about nothing all day. Really for Rip Van Winkle at least, just avoiding his wife. He didn't want to be at home because she'd only shout at him. Now, the way that Washington Irving puts it is, Rip consoled himself at a kind of perpetual club of the sages, philosophers, and other idol of the village, on a bench by a small inn. Hmm, sounds quite nice, doesn't it? Hmm, a club of sages, like wise men and philosophers. Another way of putting wise men sounds all good. Eliza says that priests aren't supposed to drink alcohol. Oh no, it's, it's fine if you're a, a priest to drink alcohol. You probably shouldn't drink too much, but there you go. Now, up on the wall of the inn, and we can just about see it in the distance here, and I've put a, a, a different version over here. Up on the wall of the inn is a big sign showing the king, King George III, because of course, these people, although they have Dutch names, and although they're living in North America, they are English citizens. They live in England, a part of England in America. So their king is the same king of England, King George III, um, famous for going quite mad every now and again. Mm. And so every day they would sit there under the sign of King George, and they would enjoy themselves, and they would chat, and they would drink, and they would salute the picture of the king because they were good noble loyal subjects of the english crown there you go um and oh um a mountain explorer has asked me what his daughter is called i don't remember what his daughter's name is something van winkle um and a mountain explorer suggests that we call her ghana van winkle okay yeah yeah why not i don't know what that means but okay why not <laughs> Um, uh, oh, I forgot the R in George. Thank you. Let's put that in now. <laughs> well spotted. There we are. That looks a bit better, doesn't it? George the Third. Um, Lucas and Joshua asks, "Is Hamilton in this story?" No, this is far too quiet and sleepy a story. Um, and as you'll notice, uh, we're going to miss the bit with Hamilton in it and quite a lot of stuff too, because one day. When Rip is, you know, he wakes up in the morning, he gets dressed, he feeds Wolf, the dog, um, and he's thinking, what shall I do with my day today? Shall I go a wandering? Shall I go and sit outside the pub? Maybe I'll go fishing. And his wife comes downstairs, Oi, what are you doing today? You need to be getting a job, you lazy man. Look at you, your estate. Oh, pull your trousers up. Oh, where's my breakfast? Uh, all this kind of stuff. I'm sure that really her voice wasn't so annoying, but it's a story, people. Go with it. Um, and he decides he's just had enough. Oh, he just needs to get as far away as possible today. Yeah. Now, often he goes to the pub and he sits there, of course, but oh, he wants to get even further. So he takes Wolf, he takes his gun, and he decides to head off up into the Catskills nice and quiet like far away from everyone even his friends let's just get some peace and quiet and go and hunt some squirrels he says oh yes squirrel hunting is his favorite thing to do uh when he really really wants to get away from everyone hmm. now here's another quote from the book rip was reduced to despair he's so sad because of his wife oh and his only alternative to escape the clamor of his wife was to take his gun into the woods. And here he is, sat down under a tree, 
Looks like he's giving Wolf a bit of a snack. Uh, they're going to have a nice day together. Now, this isn't the first time Rip has done this. Rip often travels around the place. Um, you know, when he really needs to get away, he'll go wandering. But on this particular occasion, Rip ends up going, well, further and higher up into the mountains than he normally does. Um, maybe he's, you know, thinking about other things, not really paying attention. Maybe he just really doesn't want to go home. Um, and as he's going, it starts to get dark. He realizes all of a sudden, oh my, oh dear, I seem to have spent all day in these mountains and oh, I probably should be going home now. Uh, I can't hang around here all the time. And then he starts thinking, oh no, I'm going to be so late when I get home that my wife, Dame Van Winkle, she's going to, oh, she's going to moan and moan and moan at me all night. Oh, a wife explosion, says a mountain explorer. Yes, an explosion of, of wifely anger is what's going to, to meet him. So he does turn around to go home, but to be honest, he's kind of walking a bit slowly. He's not looking forward to getting to the end of the journey. Uh, Phoebe and Kezi says, has he bought any food with him? I imagine he bought a, a bit of a snack in his pocket, but certainly not enough for a weekend away, just enough for the day. Um, so I imagine he's, he's looking forward to some food when he gets home. That's a good point. Um, but Rip isn't going to get home straight away because as he's wandering along, as it's sort of the sun is going down, it's getting a bit, a bit dimpsy, a bit twilight, um, he sees well, a very odd looking fellow, a man, seemingly from out of nowhere, is walking along, carrying a humongous barrel on his shoulder. Hmm. Now, Rip, he's a very polite man. He's a very genial man. He likes to talk to people. He's a very sociable being. And of course, he stops and he starts to talk to the man. Hello, what are you doing? And Hmm, what are you doing with that massive barrel? And what's in the massive barrel? Is it something nice? Is it something that I can try? <laughs> now, the man is a bit weird. For, a, for, for a starters, the man is wearing clothes that have been out of fashion for well, well over a hundred years. Um, he looks, and when he speaks, he sounds to have a very similar accent to Rip Van Winkle. He's definitely got a touch of the Dutch about him, yeah? Um, but he doesn't seem very happy, this man. He seems quite, quite glum. He's just kind of walking around with this barrel and Rip starts talking to him. He says, where are you going with that barrel? Well, says the figure, I'm going to take it to my friends. We're going to drink it. What's in the barrel, says Rip Van Winkle. Well, it's very strong beer in the barrel. Um, would you like to try some, says the mysterious figure. And Rip Van Winkle very much would like to try some. So the man says, come with me then. You can come and meet my friends. We're just playing, uh, we're playing Skittles. Nine pins we're playing. Uh, bowling, yeah. And we're playing it over yonder. Come with me. Now, it's at that point that Rip notices a rumble like thunder. <laughs> very, very loud, very noisy. And he looks up into the sky, the darkening sky, expecting to see a thunderstorm, but well, there's not a cloud there. It's a clear night. He can just see the stars. He thinks this is very strange, but well, I've got two options here. I can either walk back home and get shouted at by my wife, or I could follow this complete weird stranger to see meet his friends, and I might get to drink some lovely beer. Now, I'm sure by now we all know what choice Rip Van Winkle is going to make. We know he likes beer. We know he's not fond of his wife. So he follows the man further up into the mountains, further away from his wife. His dog, Wolf, following on behind. Hmm. Oh, a mountain explorer asks, is the man a wizard? Not a wizard, something far stranger than that. Hmm. Um... <laughs> It's a trick, says Sophie. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not. So, he follows the man, this man who's wearing out-of-date clothes by quite a long way, um, who's carrying the beer, that's the important bit. He follows him to a gap 
a great big cleft in the rock. Yeah, so here in the side of the mountain, there's two great big boulders, if you like, and there's a small gap between them, and the two of them walk between the gap, and there they come into a wonderful clearing. And there are loads of people there. And he understands what the sound of thunder was. It's the sound of this men's friends playing skittles. They're rolling the ball along and it's smashing down the pins. Um, and there are several of them. There, well, a few of them, yeah? Um, a few more than a few, I should say. Mm -hmm. Several is bigger than a few, whatever. Um, there's a whole group of them playing and they're drinking. There's, a, you know, the man puts down his barrel and everyone starts to drink. And there's one man in the middle with a great big long beard and an also out of date clothes. They all have out of date clothes and they're all playing this game and they're all drinking and they all look thoroughly miserable. Yeah, they're not really talking to each other. They're not joking and laughing. I mean, they're doing things that are fun. They're playing a game and they're drinking lots of beer, but they're all very serious about it and very quiet about it. It's all a bit, mm -hmm. but Rip Van Winkle, he's not, he's not put off by this necessarily. Um, I, I missed our quote here. Rip, who marveled greatly what could be the object of carrying a keg of liquor up this wild mountain, yet something strange inspired awe. So, he can't quite work, figure out why they're carrying the beer around, but he does like the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucas and Joshua ask, is Thomas the Jefferson in this story? No, no, we're going to miss out on Thomas Jefferson as well, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Rowan is worried that he's going to be spirited away by fairies. I mean, this is very similar to literal fairy stories, but don't worry. These men, they are not fairies. No. Now, um, here's Rip and the men all in their old fashioned clothes with their big bushy beards, you know, very out of date, these fashions, I must say, um, for poor old Rip. Um, but even though he might be slightly confused by what's going on, Rip soon forgets to worry about any of it once he starts to drink the beer. And, uh, here's another quote. One taste provoked another. At length his senses were overpowered, his eyes swam in his head, and he fell into a deep sleep. I mean, he's just drunk so much beer, he's fallen straight asleep. Uh, Cosmos Cat asks, is George Washington in it? Not really, but sort of, yes. Um, now, he's asleep. Oh, very good, Khadija, you've got it. Um, he falls asleep there in the middle of the mountains, under a tree. And, uh, well, there you are, he's sleeping. There's not much else to say, is there? Um, in the morning, he wakes up. A beautiful, fine morning. Um, but hang on, ooh, he scratches his head a bit. Hang on, something's not right. Then he realizes, hang on, I'm not where I, I'm not in the same spot that I fell asleep. I was with those other fellows. Hmm. Yeah, I was asleep with a whole group of people in a gap between two rocks in a nice grassy clearing. But now, hang on, I'm, I'm out here. I'm somewhere else in the mountains. Um, huh. Then he thinks, where's my dog? Wolf, wolf, come here. Come on, dog. But nothing comes. Wolf doesn't come to him. That's weird, thinks Rip. Wolf is always by my side, but not today. No, no, no. Um, he thinks, okay, well, I'd, I'd better go and say hello to the guys. You know, I, I can't just, I must have wandered off or something during the night. I must go and say thank you for that wonderful beer that I drank. I mean, it was delicious. I should really say thanks. So he gets up and he looks around and, you know, Rip Van Winkle, he's good in the mountains. He knows his way around and he remembers the path that he took to get to the cleft in the rocks. And so he follows along and he, he finds his way back to the two great big rocks with the gap. In, oh, there's no gap. The gap. Well, he's sure there was a gap yesterday, but the gap is completely filled with vegetation. There's like brambles and tree roots there. I mean, there's no way through. He shouts for Wolf a few more times. Maybe Wolf is stuck behind. But no, there's nothing there. 
Hmm. It's then that he realises something particularly weird. Um, he has an incredibly long beard. Like, really long. Way longer than it was last night. He's starting to think, hang on. There definitely was something weird about those fellows. Hmm, maybe they were fairies. Maybe they've, maybe they've cast a spell on my beard. That would be a very tricky fairy thing to do. And of course, even though he's in the new world, he's in America, Rip Van Winkle would have heard all the old fairy stories from his, you know, from, from his Dutch family growing up. So he knows that fairies are real, and he assumed that they were only lived in the Netherlands, in Holland and Europe, but well, maybe there's some fairies here now in America. Maybe they've come over on the boat with the other immigrants. I mean, it could happen, he thinks. But anyway, having a long beard is weird, but it's not the end of the world. He takes his gun, and he decides to head back home to go and get shouted at by his wife again. Ooh, where have you been? You've been out all night. Oh, you smell like beer. Oh, look at you. You've got a hole in your trousers. What have you done with the dog? Where's the dog? Oh, you've been carrying that gun around again. You're always carrying around that gun. Oh, why don't you go get a job? All that kind of stuff. He's not looking forward to it. I mean, she's usually angry with him. But when he's been away all night with no explanation, she's going to be furious. Hmm. <laughs> Lafayette is not in the story. <laughs> Sorry, Lucas and Joshua. <laughs> So, he heads back down the mountain with his gun. Now, he's a bit concerned about his gun. I mean, he must have left it. Oh, he must have left it in a wet patch or something, because there's rust all over the darn thing, you know? Yesterday it was clean. Today it's rusty. Um, it's not good. Yeah, he's going to have to go home. He's going to have to spend a good few hours today cleaning this gun and getting it set up. And he's still got to find Wolf, and he's going to have to put up with his wife, and he's going to have to have a shave as well, I guess. And well, it's a right old faff. But down he heads, back down to the village. Now, when he gets to the village, he's even more surprised. Hmm. The village seems to be different. It's, it's definitely bigger. There's way more houses. Um, well, there seems to be... Hang on. Ooh. Where was the little pub that's now... A bigger pub, like a hotel kind of thing. Um, there seem to be extra streets. Now, usually when Rip Van Winkle walks in and around the, the village, the children of the village, they run up to him and they play with him and the dogs all say hello and everyone loves it. But as he walks into the village, he sees a load of children, but none that he recognises. They all look, well, different. These aren't the children he's used for at all. Um... um he looks around some more, and a dog comes up and starts barking at him. Now, a a no dog has ever barked at Rip Van Winkle. They're all his friends, but no, this one's barking at him. He feels quite uncomfortable. He looks around at the people in the, in the crowd, uh, walking around in the streets, and he doesn't recognise any of them. None of them. It's, where's his friends? Where's his pub? Where's his house? He'd better get home to his house. He looks, go back to his house, and well, his house looks all crumbly and broken, and it looks very small compared to all these magically appearing new houses around it. It's all very, very weird. He thinks, I don't know what's going on here, but I know some men who will understand. I'll go and chat to my friends. We'll go to the pub. It'll be fine. They'll explain what's going on. I don't know what's happening. Um, now, he heads off to the pub, and, well, there's a right commotion going on. As I say, it's, the pub's a lot bigger. Um, it's a very different kind of building. It's been bit made bigger, and, well, there is still a bench outside, but his friends aren't on it. But there are a whole crowd around, and they're all talking very peculiarly. He doesn't recognise any of these people, but they seem to be having a, 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 a general argument. Um, half of them are talking about Democrats. Others are talking about Republicans. And they're talking about voting this and voting that. And who's going to vote this way? And who's going to vote that way in the election? What? Things rip. What, ele what is an elect? What? 
What's a, what's a Republican? What's a Democrat? I don't know. Up comes a random man that he's never met before. He grabs him by the arm and says, Hello, stranger. Have you come to vote? Are you going to vote for the Republicans? And he says, what, Who? What? Uh, what? And then another figure comes up from the other side and grabs his other arm. Hey, you look like the kind of guy who would like to vote for the Democrats. Come on, can we have your vote? And he's like, what? I don't know what's going on here. Who are you people? What are you doing in my village? Where's my dog? Oh. Now, everyone's kind of ignoring him. He's just some old man that's wandered in. But then he ends up being the cause of a commotion. He turns to the two men who are asking him to vote Republican or Democrat, and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I am a loyal subject of the good and noble King George III. Hurrah for England. And everyone goes silent, and they just stare at him. What did you say? Nobody supports King George of England. Everyone hates England. We just fought a war with England. What are you talking about, old man, you crazy loon? And he says, oh, I don't know what's going on. And he looks up at the sign on the inn, where normally there's the picture of George the Third. Yeah? But there isn't a picture of George the Third. Instead, there's a picture of this guy, George Washington. He'd never even heard of George Washington, but George Washington is the first president of the USA. Now, the people, they gather around him and they say, hey, who are you? Where have you come from? Why is your beard so long? Mm -hmm. He says, uh, I don't know. I just, I woke up this morning and I've come down and I can't, everything's weird. Everything's different. He says, where are my friends? They say, who are your friends? Well, what about Derek Van Bommel, the schoolmaster? <gasps> Him? Oh, he died about 18 years ago. What? What do you mean? He was here. Ye I saw him yesterday. I was drinking beer with him. Oh, well, what about Nicholas Vedder, the owner of this very pub? They say, oh, Nicholas Vedder. Wow. Well, he went off to the war and he was shot by an English soldier. What do you mean in England? He wasn't in England. What? I thought he was the English shot. Why, why did they shoot? Oh, well, what about Von Sheik, the priest? Where's he? Oh, oh, well, he fought in the war too. And well, now he's gone off to join the Congress. He's, he works for the government now. What government? You mean he's gone to England? No, the government's not in England. The government's in America. Oh, it's too confusing. Now, Rip, he asks one more question. What about uh, Dame Van Winkle? Is she here? And they say, no, sadly, she died a few years ago. Uh, she was out arguing with a trader. She got so angry, she just dropped down dead. And for the first time all morning, Rip Van Winkle smiles. Oh, well, at least there's some good news, he thinks. They say, who are you anyway? What are you doing here? We don't, we don't recognize you. He says, I'm Rip Van Winkle. They say, no, you're not. He's Rip Van Winkle. And he turns around and sure enough, there's a young man who looks, well, pretty much like he does, in his head at least. He says, well, that can't be Rip Van Winkle. I'm Rip Van Winkle. The other guy says, no, I am definitely Rip Van Winkle. This is very confusing. Hmm, huh. two Rip Van Winkles. Maybe I've been enchanted or something, he thinks. Hmm. But then an old man steps out from the crowd. The oldest man in the village. Oh, that's it, Eliza. That's it. You got it. Um, and he says, hmm, let me see. Are you, well, you look a bit like him and you seem to be the right age. Well, Rip Van Winkle, the elder... He went missing 20 years ago. He went into the Catskill Mountains and he never came home. <gasps> what? Hang on. That might be me. Well, who's that Rip Van Winkle? Well, that's Rip Van Winkle's son. Rip Van Winkle. It's all very confusing. Probably shouldn't have named his son exactly the same name as him. But there you go. He was a strange man. <gasps> Rip says, but 
how could this have happened? I went to sleep yesterday and I woke up now and it's, what, 20 years later? Exactly. Well, there is an old legend about Captain Hudson and his crew. Their ghosts are said to live in the Catskill Mountains and they appear once every 20 years and they make sounds like thunder. And there they play nine pins up in the Catskills. Maybe you ran into those. And Rip Van Winkle thinks back. He thinks about the people he met. He thinks about their old-fashioned clothes. <gasps> he must have met the ghosts of Hudson's crew, the half-man crew. <gasps> and they've sent him to sleep for 20 years. Now it's at this point that a young woman, well, about a 30-year-old woman, she comes through the crowd and she's carrying a baby. And she says, is it true? Are you really Rip Van Winkle? He says, well, I, I think I am. Yes, I, I am Rip Van Winkle. I am. She says, wow, you disappeared years ago. He says, who are you? She says, I'm your daughter, of course. Oh, my goodness. Um, let me see. Oh, yes, you do look like my daughter. And I see you've got a baby. Um, what's the baby's name? She says, why, I called it Rip Van Winkle. Whoa. This is getting confusing, he thinks. There's now three Rip Van Winkles. Rip Van Winkle him, and Rip Van Winkle his son, and Rip Van Winkle the baby. Here they are, look. Um, and he holds the baby, and he gives it a nice big cuddle. Ah. Um, and the family are reunited. Now, for a little while, Rip Van Winkle is uh, a little bit worried. What if his daughter has has grown up to be like his wife was. Yeah. Um, but luckily, she's far calmer than him, and she lets him come and live with her in her house with her new husband, who's... Wow, her new husband. He doesn't really do much. He's a bit lazy, actually. Everyone seems to like him, but he, he just kind of wanders around the village a lot. He doesn't really have a job, so to speak. Um, he's quite good at fishing, and he's quite a friendly fellow, but... To be honest, thinks Rip, he's a bit useless. Uh, may, maybe he'll shape up in, 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 in the future. Um, but he lives there in his old house with his daughter and her husband and their baby with the same name as him. And it takes him a little while. You know, we can imagine um, <laughs> Fingersdale says, no, don't start the story all over again. <laughs> it's just going to repeat over and over. <laughs> But of course, they live pretty much happily ever after. I assume that Rip um, has a shave, you know, changes his clothes, you know. Um, in the story, Wolf does come back. He's a very old dog by this point, but they are reunited. At first, Wolf doesn't know Rip and barks at him, which, you know, kind of breaks Rip's heart for a second. But after a few strokes and a, and a bit of time together... Wolf remembers Rip, and they're good friends from then on. Um, but of course, this story is... <laughs> Aaron Burr is not in this story. Unfortunately, Lucas and Joshua, all of your revolutionary war heroes are not in the story. I mean, they were around, but of course, Rip missed all that because he was asleep. He's been asleep for 20 years under a tree. Um, yeah, he missed the Revolutionary War. He missed George Washington crossing the Delaware. Delaware. Um, he missed the first... Uh, uh, writing of the Constitution and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it must have been very confusing for him. But of course, this story is all about freedom. Because as he was asleep, not only has America gained their freedom from England and have learnt to do things their own way, we can see the stars and stripes shining up there in the background. Um, but also, of course, Rip has gained his freedom from his terrible, nagging wife. There you go. <laughs> Poor man, says Fingersnail. He missed all the action. Yes, he did, didn't he? <laughs> That's it, Eliza. That's it, exactly. Hmm. Um, now, I don't know if this is a particularly nice story. Um, I, I feel like Rip's wife gets a bad deal out of the book here. Um, you know, to me, it sounds like she was probably justified to be quite angry. Um, but, you know, um, maybe not. We don't know 
the ins and outs of their relationship, I guess. Um, now, this today um, <laughs> is, is um, uh, our penultimate Mythology Monday. Last week will be the last one. Ooh. Um, uh, well, then we're going to break for the summer. Um, so next week, we're going to finish on a particularly exciting one because we're going to Arabia next time. We're going to have a look at some Arabian nights. Um, so hopefully, um, I cannot do Hamilton, I'm afraid, Lucas. Maybe I'll do that in history. Maybe in the future, we'll, we'll do some history lessons on the American War of Independence. That'd be a fun one, wouldn't it? Um, lots of interesting characters in there. Oh, good question, Jules. And this is something that I wondered about well as well. Why did no one find him asleep in the mountains? I mean, for 20 years, he sat there under a tree asleep. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. You'd have thought his dog would have woken him up, really, or at least found him. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, Cosmos Cat. I have no idea why, why we've got that in the picture either. Um, yeah, so next week, some Arabian Nights. And yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you next time. Bye.